Our first speaker, Dr. Glenn Steele. Um, first thing you know about Dr. Steele after you meet him is his name's really not Glenn. His name is Bubba. So uh, Bubba Steele has uh, been a professor of optometry at the Southern California, or the Southern College of Optometry in Memphis in the Pediatric Service for a number of years. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Uh, it, it's really our pleasure to be here today. Um, we want to hopefully motivate you, challenge you, um, and, and really get you excited about the profession that, that, that we all have chosen. Infancy is a program of, the, uh, uh, the, uh, of optometry cares the AOA Foundation. We have now just under 8,000 optometrists who have volunteered their services. But what we found when we went into uh, a program or a project with the CDC, we found that with a total of 1,051 kids, half broken down to male and female, 145 preemies, 280 non-Caucasians, 25%. 180 of those showed risk factors. 180. Now this is not the general population. This is a population that was primarily information we gathered from us being able to have access to a mobile clinic, taking the mobile clinic into areas that were not served. So it wasn't just them coming to our, our office. But we found um, one in six had risk factors. But when we looked at prematurity and, and um, socioeconomic issues, it significantly increased to one in four babies had issues, risk factors, causes for concern. Then we broke it down even further. $41,000 average income, that's not poverty level, $41,000 average income of the people in that particular um, subset of, of people, one in eight above that average had an issue, a risk factor. One in four below that number had a risk factor. So you can see that, that there are many kids, particularly in lower socioeconomic levels, that are having difficulties at a higher level than in the, uh, the higher socioeconomic levels. It's important that we reach and address those kids. So the, the results show that visual impairment, visual issues are more significant than we ever thought before, but 315 of those 1,051 had public insurance or no insurance. And the no insurance is the scary thing because more and more people are not even going for their, their uh, regular pediatrician exams because they don't have insurance and they can't afford it. It's much more important now for us to come in with a program such as Infant C. And now you can see the C CDC grant number there. But the Infant C is where we need to provide help. We need to provide help. Help. That, that's a southern term. You, you folks might call it help. A little, little, it's got an L. But down south, we don't have the L in there. It's just help. Um, but whenever diagnosis and intervention takes place at an earlier age, when it takes place at an earlier age, the chances for success in, in, um, increases dramatically over the course of the baby's lifetime. What, what are some things that you do and how do we do it? Um, one of the things that you have in making the diagnosis are you confident when you're making that diagnosis? No, it's sort of scary. But you've got the ability. You've got the ability better than anybody else out there who is making that diagnosis. It's just getting your confidence level to that point. Elena was on a developmental delay track. And if any of you have internet access, that's not Elena, but you can see Emma, who I'll show in just, just a minute. But I'll talk a little bit about here because they're both the same. On a developmental delay track, found out she was a 12 doctor hyper -op, 10 or 12 doctor hyper -op. Went back to the family caregiver. I know we've got these vision issues, patted the mom on the shoulder. 
But you know, we've got developmental delay we've got to address. Guess what? She got her glasses and most of those developmental delay issues went away. So we've gone from developmental delay to this simply from a pair of glasses. Don't underestimate what you do. You don't prescribe glasses, you change lives. You don't prescribe contact lenses, you change lives. You don't do those things. You change families' lives. So walk with them every step of the way. What else can you do? Um, next slide, Austin. Become an ambassador for infancy. Promote the program in your practice, your city, your state, and especially the parents of babies. The only way you can become an infancy provider and be listed is to be an AOA member. He has a very keen sense of awareness, and he gets on me sometimes for saying this, but I will tell you, when you walk into a room and there's 10 people sitting at the table in the room, and within five minutes, he's pointing his nose to you and calling you by name and pointing his nose to the next person and calling them by name and challenging you. It, 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 it is a very incredible use of the visual process, even though he can't see. The reason I say point your nose at people is whenever we fit people with progressive lenses, we tell them you've got to point your nose at whatever it is you've got to do to get the best clarity. So Tom has the best clarity of any per visual clarity of most sighted people that I know. So after a brief audio and video, uh, we'll bring on this special person who's become a friend, Tom Sullivan. I used a phrase the other day, uh, somebody you'd know about, Betty White, the actress. And Betty told me, she was all upset, she was saying, Jesus, and Betty is, she's 90, and she has a mouth like a sailor. I mean, <laughs> the woman just, and she said to me, I don't know, she said, all these young what do they call them? She said, they're not stars. I mean, Lindsay Lohan, Kim Kardashian. And she was going on about this. And she, then she said, you know what's wrong? I said, what's that, Betty? She said, well, talent is a gift. But character is a choice. Everybody in this room is talented. The character of your process as future docs is going to be based around the choices you make. And we, us, Glenn and I, we're here to talk about the life of a child struggling with vision loss, the life of parents who bring these children into the world and love them and yet get very little support. We're here to make a pitch, to draw you in, to suck you in, to get you to say, we want to be infancy providers. They put a piano up here. Blind people either play these or tune them. Um, do anybody watch stuff like Little House on the Prairie and Highway to Heaven? Those were my shows. Michael Landon and I produced. He said, no, no, no. He said, I'm not talking about reds and blues and oranges. I'm talking about the colors of the heart. And he kind of stopped me cold. And uh, I'm asking you, as young future docs, to invest the colors of your heart. Because the colors found within the soul have rainbows that will be all the colors of the heart they are more than you can see you've got to look beyond to find what's you and me all the colors of the heart Had I been born in 1944, I would have been dead. There were no incubators. Had I been born in 1955, the chances are reasonable I would have been able to see. So what I choose to believe is that I was slotted exactly where I belong. That my life has had, I think, in the end, more meaning as a blind person than it ever would have had had I been able to see. That's just what I choose to believe. So what do you do when you're Mr. and Mrs. Sullivan? And the guy says, your child's blind, put him in an institution. They bought it. Where did I go to school? Perkins School for the Blind. 28 acres on the Charles River in Boston. 
It's actually a great place, but I didn't know that. I hold a record at Perkins. <laughs> I was expelled 11 times <laughs> for all kinds of crap. Um, the first time they kicked my ass out, I was eight. And it was because I had gone down to the kitchen in the middle of the night and stolen chocolate chip cookies and brought the cookies upstairs and gave them to all the little blind kids and they got cookie dough all over their sheets. And so <laughs> I was in the principal's office in the punishment chair the next day when she came in. I was eight, she was 80, Helen Keller. It changed my life. Miss Keller came in with her guide, Polly, and Polly signed to Miss Keller that there was a little boy in trouble, and Miss Keller said, why? And Polly said that I had stole cookies and I heard this beautiful, beautiful little voice. She said, little boy, they tell me you're a devil. <laughs> Is that right, little boy? And I took her beautiful hand and spelled, yes. And she went, oh, good, keep it up. <laughs> How do you find a mentor? How do you find someone to believe in? And if you're a family, who do you believe in when the rubber meets the road and you're told that your child either has a major vision loss or is blind? A little boy who'd been playing in the real game came by the fence. Doctors, you don't just treat the eye. You treat the whole family. Because sometimes Kids can be amazingly cruel. I want you to hate the idea of vision loss. I want you to compete. And so let me outline as clearly as I can your mission to cope with pediatric vision loss. Your mission, young men and women, is to preserve vision and eliminate blindness from the face of the earth. That's not your mission, get the hell out. Give your dad back the tuition. Quit. Your mission is to preserve vision and to eliminate blindness from the face of the earth. We know that there are 36 million blind people in this world and 70% of what is out there is preventable with intervention. And it's even higher with children. Even higher. So I want you to compete against the scourge of vision loss. I want you to get competitive, to feel it deep down inside. Well, I became competitive. And I realized that somehow I would have to break out of the yard I was in to find the world. But what was between me and freedom? An eight foot high chain link fence. Sometimes in life, you need miracles to happen. My miracle happened. His name is Billy Hannon. Billy has been my best pal for 55 years. Billy and his brother Mike moved into the house that had just been built on the other side of my fence and I'd hear them over there in the yard and I realized that somehow I needed to get to them. I needed to find a way out. I needed to break out. It was May 8th, 1957. I grabbed hold of the chain link fence and pulled myself up hand over hand, hand over hand and got to the top and stood up on the top of the fence and literally, like Leonardo DiCaprio, leaped into space. I'm king of the world! And I crashed on the ground and Billy Hannon came running over and with his Boston accent, he said, wow. He said, that was a gnarly fall. He said, I'm Billy Hannon. I said, I'm Tom Sullivan and I'm blind. And he went, wow. <laughs> and then this little boy 
said the three most important words I have ever heard. Billy said, want to play? Want to play? Want to hope? Want to dream? Want to take a chance? Want to go for the gold? Want to win it all? Even lose? Want to play? And Billy taught me to do that. Let me make this as personal as I can. I have made friends all over the world. I've had an amazing life. I've made millions and millions of dollars and I would give all of it up just to see Patty's face once when she looks at me. That is not going to happen. But every parent that brings an infant into the world is going to be coming to you with a prayer as they sit in your waiting room waiting to see you. And the prayer is, make sure my baby's eyes are okay. Take care of my child. People operate at moments of turning point in life, young men and women. You've had some of them. You may have lost a loved one. You may have had failures that you've had to live with. You may feel inept in one way or another, although you have youth on your side and it's a wonderful thing. And you have intelligence and talent. And my prayer is that you have the character to be great optometrists, to be great doctors. But there are turning points in people's lives, and when they face these turning points, we define them. Humans are tested. Character is tested. And I didn't feel it was appropriate for me to come here without allowing you to understand that I haven't always done it right. That I've faced turning points and failed. We have two children. Patty and I had two children. Our daughter Blythe and our son Tom. When our daughter was three, we came to California because I was trying to chase the dream and be a big star. What you need to know is that at that point in my life, I was a selfish, angry, aggressive, hostile person. Because I felt like I had been cheated because I was blind. See, when I even went to Harvard and I was number one in my class, no one ever said, he's smart. They said, isn't he a smart blind guy? No matter how good I was at everything, the only kid who'd play with me on weekends was Billy. And Patty, the beautiful Patty, married me. And looking back, I wondered, now I wonder why. Because I was a jerk. So we came to California, and what I wanted was stardom. It was June. Patty had gone to the store to shop for groceries. My job was to watch Blythe and Tom telephone rang. The guy on the other end was the late, great Tonight Show host, Johnny Carson. Carson and Ed McMahon, his sidekick, had been in a nightclub the night before and they'd seen me perform and Carson was calling to ask if I'd like to do the show. It was my first big show business break. I got so involved in the conversation that I never heard the sound of my little girl, Blythe, across the living room and I never heard the sound of the patio door open and I never heard her feet cross the deck but you can bet, doctors, I heard the sound of the splash <coughs> when she fell in the swimming pool. I screamed her name. Blythe! Blythe! I crossed the 
room and got outside and fell over chairs and tables and stuff and got to the edge of the pool and I literally rolled into the water. And I thought the only way I'll find this child is to dive down and swim along the bottom and hope to God I'll touch a hand, a foot, anything, something. And I'd get to the end and I came up and I was counting seconds, 31, 32, and I jumped back, I dove back down and swam a lap going the other way and nothing, 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 nothing. And I came to the surface and I counted seconds, 61, 62, and I looked up to heaven and I said, God, isn't this some joke? You've given me everything. The girl of my dreams, the Olympics, a Harvard education. Two beautiful children and now this child is going to die and it's my fault because I'm blind, you son of a bitch. And then I heard a quiet sound. You wouldn't hear it. Not because you couldn't. Only because you wouldn't. It was the sound of our air bubbles. And they blipped. Blipped. Blipped their way to the surface. And I followed them. And dove down and found her in about nine feet of water and brought her up and respirated her. And when she breathed, it was uh, like the sound of a dove on a summer night. But what, why, what, what do I want out of this? Why take you down this road? Every day in your profession, you are going to face people who are scared to death that something might be wrong with their child. It's our prayer that you see them early enough, that you make a difference early enough. When you walk out of here today, it is my hope that each young future doctor will say, Tom, I'm an infancy dog, I promise. <laughs>